On Monday, I came up with the perfect plan. No one even knew we were friends. On Tuesday, he stole a gun from his dad. On Thursday, while the entire school was in the gym, we waited just outside the doors. I was to use the gun on whoever walked out first. Then he would take the gun and go into the gym blasting. I walked up to Mr. Queen, the guidance counselor, and shot him in the face two times. He fell back into the gym. Dead. The shots were deafening. We heard screams in the auditorium one could not see us yet. I handed him the gun and whispered, Your turn. He ran into the gym and started firing. I followed the moment after. He hadn't hit anyone yet. Kids were scrambling and hiding. It was mayhem. I ran up behind him and tackled him. We struggled. I wrenched the gun out of his hands, turned it on him, and killed him. I closed his mouth forever. On Friday, I was anointed a hero. It was indeed the perfect plan. It was 1 a.m. and Guy Helverson sat in his dark living room. He hadn't moved for over an hour. The accident earlier that evening kept playing over and over in his mind. The light turned red, but he was in a hurry and accelerated. An orange blur came from his right, and in a split second there was a violet jolt. Then the bicyclist rolled across his hood and fell out of sight. Horns bled angrily, and he panicked, stepping on the gas and screeching away from the chaos into the darkness, shaken and keeping an eye on his rear view mirror. Why did you run? You idiot! He'd never committed a crime before this, and punished himself by imagining years in jail, his career gone, his family gone, his future gone. Why not just go to the police right now? You can afford a lawyer. Then someone tapped on the front door, and his world suddenly crumbled away beneath him. They found me. There was nothing he could do but answer it. Running would only make matters worse. His body trembling. He got up, went to the door, and opened it. A police officer stood on the porch light. Mr. Helverson asked the grim officer. He let out a defeated sigh. Um, yes, let me... I'm sorry, but I'm afraid I have some bad news. Your son's bike was struck by a hit-and-run driver. He died at the scene. I'm very sorry for your loss. Sign here, please. The doctor hung the device around his neck. Mr. Weatherby... All of your tests has come back negative, and my examination shows nothing abnormal. Adam knew what was coming next. I'm not crazy, doctor. I'm sorry, but there is no physical reason for why you lose control of your hand. A psychologist can help you. I don't need therapy. I need answers. They seem to have a life all their own. I can't hold a job. I'm under investigation for assault. I almost killed my neighbor. I'll try anything at this point. After two weeks on a new medication, Adam saw no progress and grew increasingly depressed. He was convinced that despite what the doctor said, it was not a psychological problem. That night, a frustrated and angry Adam sat in a chair and drank bourbon, drunk and hopeless. He stumbled to the garage and started at the table saw, then slowly lowered his wrists toward the screaming blade. Detective Armstrong entered the garage, where uniformed officers stood over the blood-soaked body. So, what do we get? He asked. Taking in a blood splattered scene. This is a weird one. Detective. How so? Take a look at the body. He apparently chopped off his hands with the table saw and bled to death. Armstrong knelt. And? And we can't find his hands anywhere. I don't know why I looked up, but when I did, I saw him there. He stood against my window, his forehead rested against the glass, and his eyes were still in light, and he smiled a lipstick red, cartoonish grin, and he just stood there in the window. My wife was upstairs, sleeping. My son was in his crib, and I couldn't move. I froze, and watched him looking past me through the glass. No, please no. His smile never moved, but he put a hand up, and slid it down the glass, watching me with matted hair and a yellow skin through the window. I couldn't do anything. I just stayed there, frozen, fit still in the bushes I was pruning, looking into my home. He stood against my window. This is what I do every night. He's my guest. People started falling from the sky by the close of the decade. 
They were never dressed, always naked, always a petrifying grin on their faces. It had been just a few at first, but then hundreds and thousands would fall at a time, destroying cars and homes, and blocking off highways. Strange discoveries were made upon research. They were human, but lacked any blood or even a heart. No one could explain the hideous grins they had, or even where they came from. It was a woman, who made the latest and most disturbing discovery. She recognized one of the fallen bodies as a long-dead relative, one who died back when she was a teenager. Then more and more identifications were made. Soon people were picking out their long, dead loved ones amongst the video feeds. No one could explain why they were coming back, falling from the sky. Even more distressing, after disposing of the bodies, it wouldn't be long until the same body came plummeting from the sky again and again. You couldn't get rid of them, no matter what. People were getting killed by the higher volume of the falling bodies. And soon after burial, they too began to fall. My mother was killed when a body landed on her car, crushing her. The next week, the news reported on a body that had gotten lodged in an airplane windshield. I saw my mother's grinning face. The happiest I'd ever seen her. They say when hell is full of people, the dead shall walk the earth. Where are you? I screamed, panicked. I ran through the abandoned farm. I can't find her. Not in the old house. Not in the bar. My heart racing. As I scanned the area, I run into a mound of dirt and trip, sprawling to the ground, getting up. It hits me. Abandoned farm. I tripped over freshly tilled earth, crouching down. I start frantically cloning with my hands, scooping handfuls of dirt. I hit something hard. It was wood. Are you in there? I cry, pressing my ear to the wood. I hear muffled cries. I start digging again, but realize it's taking too long. Looking around, I see a garden shed. I sprint to it, ripping the door open. I see a shovel, still caked in dirt. Probably the same one that bastard buried her with. I grabbed it, running back. I started digging with purpose. Soon the wooden box is exposed. I toss the shovel and trip open the crate. She stares back at me, eyes wide, bound, gagged, but alive. I sigh with relief. Thank God. I reach into my bag, pulling out my rag and chloroform. I crouch down, placing it over her face. She struggles and faints. I toss her over my shoulder. Hell! My brother says as I walk back to the truck with a smirk. You found her? Yep. He almost hit me though. All right. My turn. Where did you put her? I gesture to the creek area. Mm, somewhere over there. Drownings and issue though. Jerk? He says, running off. I smile, watching him go. I love adult hide and seek. Look, I'll be the first to admit I'm a complete bastard. I'm also lazy. I'm only here to find the idiot. There's almost an idiot. This support group is pretty typical. We connect it online, decided on a quiet place. Jerome takes the lead, pouring everyone a cup of tea as he starts talking. I'm Jerome. You can drink your tea, but only after explaining why you're here. I'll start. He tells us he's never been loved. I can see why. The guy's ugliest scene. He sips his tea while the mousy chick speaks next. Meal. She says, short and sweet, no blubbering, gotta admire Mio. She's probably not the idiot. Next to talk are a legless veteran, a broken businessman, a needle track junkie, and a diseased old crone. Then it's my turn. I'm an ass. Everyone hates me. I take a loud, annoying slurp of Olang as the fat kid with the black eye goes next, telling his boring fat kid sub story. Afterward, we're all sitting quietly when Jerome kills over. Then Mio's eye roll back and she slumps forward. The fat kid said, I thought this was a suicide support group. Found the idiot. It is, I say, spitting out my mouth full of tea. This support it. No one wants to die alone, kid. Oh, how goes white he turns, looking into his cup. I love it. I never have to lift a finger. Told you I'm a lazy bastard.